We're going to talk about each disease in turn, a bit of the basic biology of that disease, and then some of the broader issues related to each disease that I think are most important for us. I think each of the ones that we covered is interesting to us as anthropologists for slightly different reasons. So I want to talk a bit about that. Okay. I'm interested in smallpox for, for a few reasons. I think we should all be interested in smallpox for a few reasons. The first fascinating fact about smallpox is it's one of exactly two diseases that have ever been eradicated, right? Human diseases, that is. Smallpox being the first, the second being one called Rinderpest, which probably none of you have heard of. Rinderpest, not a particularly huge deal. Smallpox, as we will learn in a moment, a very huge deal. So even just from the point of view of basic science, smallpox is fascinating to us for that reason. This was something that used to terrorize millions and millions of people and was effectively wiped off the face of the earth. The second reason that I'm so interested in smallpox is that it no longer exists right in human beings. And yet, we keep vials of it stored in freezers on army bases and in research institutes and things because there's still a lot that we can learn from smallpox. And every year our scientific methods become a bit more sophisticated, right? And we can resubmit smallpox to more interesting studies. But have any of you been vaccinated for smallpox? One of you. <laughs> yes. None of the rest of you has. Right. So the problem, folks, is that if smallpox got out in the world again, we would none of us be safe. So should we hang on to smallpox? And if we should, who should hang on to it, etc.? So I think smallpox presents us with a fascinating debate about scientific ethics. All of you are scientists. You're all interested in health. This should be the kind of thing that you talk about with your friends over a cup of coffee. The last reason that I'm especially interested in smallpox relates to the first, which is this question of eradication. Smallpox was successfully eradicated through a good old-fashioned vaccination campaign. Show us your arm, Gabby. Do you have your... Yeah. You end up with like this little pucker mark in your deltoid, right, where the intramuscular syringe went in as a kid, usually, so then you grow up with a scar. Not big, huge sanitation measures, not bed nets, right? Not even cures, just vaccinations. In the light of the current outbreak of vaccine-preventable illnesses like measles, <gasps> smallpox opens up a fascinating set of debates about vaccination. Let's talk about the basic biology of smallpox. What is it? Well, it is a virus, first and foremost. It's neither parasitic nor bacterial. It is viral. And it is caused by a virus of the family pox virus. Does anybody know any other poxes? Not chicken pox. Ha ha! Chicken pox is actually caused by which virus? Herpes. Yes. Outstanding. In fact, in this room, raise your hand if you have herpes. Everybody's embarrassed. 90% of you have it, actually. 90% of everyone on earth has herpes. Herpes is a huge family of fascinating viruses. Epstein Barr virus. Has anybody had mono? Yeah, I did. Don't be embarrassed. You've all had mono. Uh, yeah, that's herpes virus. Chicken pox. Most of us as kids had chicken pox, and if you get it as an adult, it's known as shingles, exactly. Cold sores, ulcerations, all sorts of these things. Uh, cytomegalovirus, which is a particularly exotic infectious virus, is actually just herpes. So, pox, when we talk about smallpox being a member of the pox family, we're thinking of things like cowpox. Have people heard of cowpox? Cowpox, monkeypox, a few of these other sort of rarer pox viruses. There are two types, two variants of the smallpox virus. They are known as variola major and variola minor. Can you guess which one is more dangerous? Major, yeah. Major is more contagious and more aggressive. When you catch major, you suffer serious symptoms and you usually die from it. How do you catch it? Well, it's airborne, which makes us nervous, right? Can you imagine what the reproductive number looks like on an airborne disease? We spoke about measles back before the break, having an insanely high reproductive number. Does anyone remember? Yeah, golly. As opposed to Ebola, HIV, some of these scary diseases that have r naughts like in the neighborhood of one or two, right? Order of magnitude more dangerous. Smallpox is airborne, small droplets. So when you're coughing, the people around you get very sick. 
Shows is a systemic illness, so you're going to end up with fever, malaise, pain, you'll feel unwell. But the most dramatic, most sort of shocking symptom of smallpox are lesions. These, they start as little, little lesions and they grow into sort of fluid-filled blisters. They begin in the mouth and throat and then spread all over the body. Fatal in about 30 to 35 percent of cases. All right, that's variola major we're talking about. Minor is often no big deal. You can carry minor more easily, longer term, be asymptomatic. But major, about one third of the time, will kill you. As far as deep research on smallpox, its status right now makes it tough for us to learn more about it. Remember how much molecular clocking we did with HIV. You guys remember this, right? We would compare versions of the virus to see how quickly it had mutated, to tell how old it was, when it had arrived in one place or the other. Tougher to do with smallpox, because nobody has it anymore, right? So applying clocking technology to this is a real drag. Can't do it without sort of exposing everyone to disastrous risk. So best guess, anyway, 10,000 years old. How do we know this? We have found Egyptian mummies, and this is so great, Egyptian mummies whose preserved skin actually has smallpox blisters on it. So we know at least they were getting smallpox, and quite possibly people before them. In terms of how dangerous smallpox is, it's really hard to wrap your head around this, especially for a disease that many of you have never even thought of. Current best estimate is that in the 20th century, in other words, from 1901 to 1999, between 300 and 500 million people were killed by smallpox. That is staggering. How many people were killed by HIV in the 20th century? 25 million, 30 million, like maybe? So is smallpox the most deadly virus ever? Quite possibly, quite possibly. For instance, many of us are familiar with the historical example of the arrival of European explorers, traders, colonizers in North America, right? And that when they arrived at first, some aspects of that relationship were friendly and trade-based and others were a bit more nasty and acquisitive and colonial, but that within short order, something like 90% of the native inhabitants of North America died. Were they killed off by war, by famine? Not really. The vast majority of that 90% died of variola major, ladies and gentlemen. The theory goes that Europeans have been exposed to smallpox for so long that we had at least some baseline immunity against it in that part of the world. But that in the new world, so to speak, smallpox represented one of these classic novel pathogens. No ecosystem accommodation for smallpox in North America at the time of European arrival, which meant that the entire population was at risk. And so it cut through like wildfire and depopulated the continent very, very quickly. Same goes for South America, incidentally, with the arrival of the Spanish and, and the Portuguese. The reason that I've got that date up there, 26 October 1977, that to me sounds like an important date. Why? 26 October 1977 is the very last day that somebody on planet Earth walked into a doctor's office and was diagnosed with an original case of smallpox. Fascinating, right? That's the last known case. The decision to call it eradicated is kind of a political decision, right? How do you decide for sure that the disease is officially gone? Well, you could say it's been 12 months since the diagnosis. Uh, the last person with smallpox has died or been cured, something like that. That's a slightly more arbitrary choice. But this one for sure, we have the date, the time, the place, everything. We can say this about almost no other disease in human history. This is absolutely fascinating. There's a moment when one person got sick with this disease for the very last time. So how did we do it? Well, the reason that I was interested in talking about this disease, I said was because it was eradicated. It's important to go back in history and understand the process of variolation. Sound familiar? Do we recognize the root word there? Variola, right? Turns out that thousands of years ago, centuries, centuries back, we can go to, for instance, ancient China and find examples of physicians who recognized a few important things about smallpox. One of them was that if you'd had smallpox once, you didn't tend to get sick again. And number two, that if smallpox entered through your skin, 
the infection would be more mild than if you inhaled it, if you caught it right through the air. And so, it was a probably very brave and very persuasive Chinese doctor in the year 1000 who picked some scabs off a person who was sick with smallpox and then walked over to one of his patients. Can I have a patient? Raji? Yes, don't be nervous. And he got out his scalpel or whatever they had, makes a cut in the guy's skin, pushes one of the scabs into that cut, and then closes it up. He variolated his patient, right? He voluntarily inserted variola into that patient's body via the skin so that the patient would experience a milder form of the illness, produce antibodies against it, and then be far less likely to get sick with that virus later. This is also known as inoculation. We've heard of this, right? Introducing a small amount of the pathogen to prompt an immune response, produce memory cells that recognize that intruder, and then make you protected later on in life. Later, this process is taken slightly further by a bearded gentleman by the name of Edward Jenner. Edward Jenner living in the UK. We have more information about him because this happened more recently. The Chinese tradition of variolation has been sort of lost, unfortunately, to time. Jenner takes variolation a step further, and we are already well on our way to having understood the science of inoculation by the time stable, injectable vaccines start getting produced. Jenner was more interested, for instance, in using similar viruses to prompt a partial response. So if somebody has been exposed, let's say, to cowpox, they may be less likely to die of smallpox. Biologically, this is a similar concept. There are a few key things that make this possible. Our first, perhaps, among those is the fact that smallpox has no animal reservoir. Smallpox is people only, which gives us a huge advantage in the eradication race. Think about that for a second. If you can get rid of that last person on 26th of October 77 who has wild smallpox, then nobody else can catch it. That was the last reservoir on earth of smallpox. So when that person's been brought into care, that is officially the final light bulb switched off, right? This is what makes most other diseases like influenza, like Ebola, so much more complicated so much more scary. You could eradicate every single case of influenza on Earth tomorrow, but as long as there's still chickens and pigs out there that have the flu, and we still live near those chickens and pigs, it's going to get reintroduced, right? So smallpox logistically was a simpler problem to solve. In terms of the debate about keeping smallpox around, but rest assured, there are currently a handful of places on Earth that smallpox is kept. America and Russia both have strategic stockpiles kept in their freezers. And every time one of them says to the other, boy, we should really get rid of our smallpox, the other usually says, sure, sure, you first. And then, um, yeah, then we promise we'll get rid of ours. And then secondly, for those of you interested in problems of government and public health, the question of smallpox vaccination campaigns is also an interesting one. We know that vaccinating people is kind of expensive, right? Every time the government of Canada ramps up and orders 10 million more flu vaccines or something, they have to pay cash for that. And even if the vaccines only cost a buck each, that's still 10 million bucks. And then you've got to get a whole pile of nurses and techs and doctors to keep injecting those vaccines into people. It takes time, costs money. And there's no vaccine or no medical procedure period that comes without a little bit of risk. There's going to be one person in a thousand who has some kind of adverse reaction to the shot. So. Should we vaccinate people against smallpox, a disease that we think no longer exists? Or should we hope that smallpox never rears its head again, that it doesn't get allowed out of the freezer? We used to build bomb shelters, ladies and gentlemen, in hope that there would never be a nuclear war. Should we therefore vaccinate ourselves against smallpox in hope that it is never used as a biological weapon?